Um, yeah, so this is uh, it's a really basic introduction to this stuff that I've been doing now for the past few years. Um, so in short, this is a, a newish, although it has some history, a uh, newish tool to prove uh, communication lower bounds by reductions to lower bounds in a simpler model. So you don't have to work so hard. You only understand a simpler model, and you automatically, by these lifting theorems, get lower bounds in a stronger model. So um, this technique is called queries of communication lifting because the two models um, here are the simpler model decision trees. I hope people have seen this before. But just to set up notation, um, I'm looking at Boolean functions on n input bits. And I typically, in, for this, uh, the query setting, I denote the input by z. So a decision tree is just a, a tree where the nodes are labeled with the input variables. That means um, the, the semantics are that you evaluate a decision tree by starting to trace a path from root to a leaf. You hit a variable, it means if you query it, you look it up, and based on the value, you branch down until at the end of the leaf, you output a value. So for any Boolean function, you can ask, what is its decision tree complexity? So what's the least height of a representation of the function like this? And for some notation, I use so use um, I, I kind of borrow notation from classical Turing machine complexity. So I, uh, for deterministic models, I can look at its decision tree analog um, for deterministic computations. And I put this superscript DT to mean decision tree complexity. And I can define the decision tree complexity of a Boolean function as, the, again, the least height of a decision tree. So the notation is just carefully chosen so that I can you know, model that notation for communication protocols. So these are a uh, more powerful model of computation. Again, we're computing a Boolean function, but now the input is split into two parts. There's a Alice part x, or maybe the first n over 2 input bits and a bob part, maybe the right-hand side of the input. And now, of course, the most natural way to define a communication protocol is that you have Alice and Bob, and they send messages to each other uh, until they can know what the function evaluates to. But just to kind of highlight the connections to decision trees, I can draw a protocol in a tree-like fashion. I can um, I now associate it with the internal nodes arbitrary predicates of either the Alice part of the input or the Bob part of the input. So this would, in this picture, Alice would speak first. Alice's one bit message is just a function of her input. And maybe in the next round, Bob speaks. So now Bob looks at his input and sends a message based on that. But of course, the message can depend on what Alice sent. So these predicates might be different. So just uh, drawing protocols like this, it's kind of obvious that they're no more powerful than decision trees. If I have a decision tree for a function, I get a communication protocol, no matter how the input bits are split between Alice and Bob. So my notation for the deterministic communication complexity of function is just, I say, superscript CC, communication complexity. So just to reiterate, you give me any s little f, if I turn it into a capital F by specifying a bipartition of the input bits, then you know, this complexity is always lower. And it's easy to come up with functions where communication protocols are much more powerful than decision trees. So like a silly example is just um, if you look at the AND function. And input bits. If you're a deterministic decision tree, so this is an OR function, I guess. If you want to evaluate the OR function, you ha really have to read all the bits until, I mean, what if you read bits and they just come out 0, 0, 0? You don't know whether there's a one in input until you've read everything. So the query complexity here would be n. But a communication protocol is really easy to compute this. You just look at your input and 
the two players determine whether they see one in their own, own part. So these are much more general, uh, much more powerful in general. The point of this area is to find situations in which you could, so general situations in which you could equate the powers of the two models. And so we can't, uh, silly examples where um, take a function that's hard for query complexity and no matter how you partition the bits it just won't be hard for communication protocols but there is a transformation we can do that we generally con uh, conjecture and that's a gadget composition so we can start with any boolean function you know you would study these in query complexity and there's this standard way to convert it into a kind of an equivalent we think communication problem whereby you replace the input variables with a small two-party gadget or two um, two-party function so the picture looks like this so you come up with some two-party function so it there's some inputs to Ali some inputs to Bob Spits out one bit. Right, so you fix a gadget and then you just put n copies of it, one for each variable. So this little x is picked from this set. So the general conjecture is that if you choose this gadget carefully enough, and hopefully it's a small gadget so you don't kind of disturb the function too much, um, now a function like this seems like it might be hard for communication protocols because to compute such a function, well, how would you evaluate it? You don't know what the input bits to f are until you've solved this underlying copy of g. So if g requires, you know, it's somewhat hard. It requires some number of bits to, for a protocol to um, compute. It seems as if uh, whenever you wanted to query an input bit into a Tavina protocol, you had to spend some bits to decode the underlying gadget. So this would be capital F. Right. So the notation might be the capital F is F composed with n copies of the gadget. And uh, it should be clear that uh, the communication complexity of capital F is at most the decision tree of little f times the communication cost of the gadget. Yeah. Okay, this is not mine. <laughs> So let me maybe <coughs> mention a really canonical example of a composed function that's um, it's maybe the most famous example in communication complexity, which is just or of ands. So it's called disjointness. So I would be here using gadgets that are just two bits, they take one bit from either player. Well, all are is, again, classically hard for query complexity, so you would, by this kind of intuition, think that a function like this might be hard uh, for communication complexity. And that's there are many theorems um, proving that this is hard, even for randomized protocols. It's maybe the most famous result in the area. It's not actually easy to show that randomized protocols need linearly many bits to compute this. but um, this lifting area, you basically want to go a bit further. And or here is very specific. For some applications, maybe you need interesting, more interesting outer functions. Um, so yes, like Avi said, it's also always true that if we attach small gadgets, then you don't make the function terribly much harder, and a protocol can always simulate a decision tree. So. So you always get this upper bound.
times, well, the commu communication complexity of the gadget. So it's just that if you have a decision tree querying some bits, the way you simulate it, every time you, the decision tree queries a variable, well, at that point, you solve the underlying gadget to figure out what that variable uh, evaluates to. So a lifting theorem wants to make this an equality. And the earliest fully fledged lifting theorem is exactly in this setting. So it was due to um, Ross and McKenzie, something like 99. And it says that for every outer function, there is a choice of a gadget, and the gadget they were using was called um, indexing. So, so this is a function where Alice has some pointer. So you should think of m here as um, polynomial in n. Pointer Bob receives. this m bit string and the function just evaluates to well this is Alice's pointer this is Bob's string he's just map map to the x bit of y now well, Alice's pointer points to Bob's string so So what these guys proved is that if you stick this indexing gadget here in a polynomial size, then, well, the <laughs> uh, deterministic communication complexity of this is just log m bits or log n. So let me just stick this in. And they prove that this is an equality. So there's no better protocol than the most obvious one. Um, in fact, <laughs> their result was a bit buried in the paper. They were really interested in showing lower bounds for uh, monotone formulas or for uh, monotone circuit depth uh, using these connections between circuits and communication protocols. But this is a kind of a maybe modern rephrasing of the previous essentially uh, in their paper. So. <laughs> My goal really is to uh, go through in chronological order some lifting theorems that are improved and give applications of them. That's the first, first part of the talk. So I think only in the second part do we get to see proofs. So let me mention a, a recent application of this. I can fit it here. Two. The data of log n is then fine. You can possibly save a constant factor. Yeah, um, we very rarely care about constant factors, um, but uh, and you may wonder about eliminating the log n whatsoever. Yeah, so that's a, as I mentioned, it's a huge open problem to get the gadget sizes down to a constant. And so you will eventually be interested in replacing p with r p or m p or very you know, right. So like, this gives you the fundamental template, like. What are the, you know, how can you vary this theorem? Well, one is uh, said, ma make the gadget size a constant, that's the that golden standard. And the other one is, well, you just uh, look at different kinds of um, models of computation. Is it possible theoretically to make constant? Come again? Is it theoretically possible to reduce gadget to be constant? Yeah, so we don't know really of any counterexamples. I would optimistically go into conjecture, you can do it here. Um, I'll mention next a theorem where we do have constant size gadgets. So uh, in some settings, it's, it's possible. So um, an application. It's maybe to the like, most famous open problem in communication complexity called log rank conjecture. So yeah, it's due to law of us and Sachs. And so they conjecture that you can characterize the communication complexity of uh, any capital F, well, in terms of its rank over real. So capital F 
you can view as a Boolean matrix. The rows are indexed by Alice's inputs, columns by Bob's inputs. So what they conjecture is that for any communication problem or a Boolean matrix, <coughs> the deterministic communication complexity is it's not hard to show that it's lower bounded by the log of the rank of the this f thought of as a matrix. They also could, the conjecture is really about an upper bound. I think they originally conjectured this should be linear, that there's a sequence of counterexamples to this, that if this were to be true, we still don't know, um, you at least need to allow a polynomial relationship. So the conjecture is something like this. Just in terms of the wider law bound is natural for those relevant to communication complexities. I mean, this picture more or less says that the matrix of F will be partition to rectangles, which are monochromatic. So monochromatic rectangles in a polar matrix is something like a triangle. It's just a dark picture. So yeah, so just to maybe say that visually, if you have your Boolean matrix here, you can visualize Alice's sending of your first bit as partitioning the rows into two parts, those where Alice sends a one, those where Alice sends a zero. The next round of the communication, Bob sends a bit, which induces a further partition of these um, sub-rectangles, finer and finer, until at the very end, you've computed some kind of a partition where each part needs to be monochromatic because you can, you know, the protocol gives an answer. So, yeah, any protocol communicating C bits induces a partition to two to the C monochromatic rectangles. And that gives you a rank decomposition because the, this is a rank one matrix, all one sub matrix. Used to. Um, so the current best lower bound for this showing that you know, if this were to be true, you need it um, as some you know, constant larger than one. You say application, and this is so we did this a few years back. So, so we show this an example of capital F, where the deterministic communication complexity is at least log squared of the rank. Okay, maybe some, there's some polylog factors, but this is essentially the best known. And it uses this lifting theorem, paired up with um, you know, similar kind of a statement for rank. So let me formulate that. A lifting theorem for rank. Um, so this is, again, for any f, there's a kind of a easy direction of a lifting theorem for rank is to get an upper bound for this in terms of some complexity measure of just the Boolean function f. The right measure is its degree as a multilinear polynomial times maybe the, again, the complexity of the gadget. Okay, so this is really should be log rank. So both you know, rank linear algebraic measure and the degree of a Boolean function is a multivariate real polynomial, also a kind of a linear algebraic measure. So this is kind of the easy direction here. Like if you write this out as a polynomial, essentially each of the monomials will give you, you know, some part of the decomposition for this uh, Matrix. I'm maybe not assuming you, you know, see that immediately, but um, it's not hard. And <laughs> the punchline is that to show something like this, it only suffices to show an analogous separation in for query complexity. So uh, this it suffices. exhibit a little f 
where the decision tree complexity of f is at least uh, the square of the degree. So this is orders of magnitude easier to prove statements like this. And the reason this implies this is just because, well, take my little f, now compose it with this index gadget, and apply the, uh, the rosen mckenzie lifting. So it means that from this complexity is roughly the same as this complexity. OK, that's approximately the same. And we want also a lower bound on this side. We can just use this. Um, like the easy direction for the connection between rank and degree. So I guess it's like this. And there is no way we know can conceive of to prove super quadratic separation. So the largest gap that you could hope for query complexity is a cubic, cubic. gap. Oh, yeah. So technique might give you a cubic here if you're creative enough. But it can never give you better. So it's known that query complexity and degree are polynomially related. So yeah, at most cubically related. It's actually known that the log rank conjecture in this sense is true uh, for these composed functions. Because, well, the deterministic complexity is given by the query complexity, which is polynomially related to the degree. But OK, that's just a. Uh, some kind of a taste taster. Okay. So let yeah, let me mention fully what's most impressively known about uh, these rank measures. So this is then a lifting theorem due to Shurstov, and independently due to Xi and Zhu. Something like this. So they study measures that are robust versions of rank called uh, approximate rank. So maybe I'll denote it like this. So this is just defined as the least rank of a matrix, so a real matrix, that agrees with you know, whatever matrix I care about, uh, entry-wise to within 1%, let's say. So you're not exactly representing the Boolean matrix, but point-wise, you're 1% close. So what's the least rank of a matrix that does that? That's by definition, the uh, approximate rank. One tenth. One tenth <laughs> yeah, I guess this is your error. Uh, it, yeah, it doesn't really matter what number you put in here. All constants are related. Uh, say. True. And so you can define a similar notion here. You look at the least degree of a multivariate polynomial that agrees with your Boolean function entry-wise to within one third. On the Boolean cube. It's a real yes. Yeah, so they have a lifting where you can actually take this to be of constant size. So, so you don't even need this factor here, I suppose. It's just a true up to constant. And this is interesting because of uh, quantum communication complexity. So it's not terribly hard. Um, it's known that the log of the approximate rank lower bounds the quantum communication complexity. Which I'm not going to define the model, but that's maybe the main motivation to study these linear algebraic measures. In fact, um, using this method, you can prove a tight lower bound for the, communi the quantum communication complexity of set disjoints, which is root n. The classical protocols need linear n. Here you can get a quadratic speed up in the quantum world. And it's also the only technique we know of to prove these root n lower bounds for multi party versions of this joiners. So, I mean, somehow, yes, so rank of course is a kind of a linear algebraic notion, whereas I tend to think of like, deterministic communication query complexity as a combinatorial notion. So the proofs of these kinds of statements are completely different, uh, which is maybe explains why here we can do away with constant size gadgets here. 
um, we don't know yet. But it could be the, the same statement holds for the yep. index of the content type. Yeah. Um, I might. So th there's actually just a couple of weeks back a, uh, a recent breakthrough that says, so I said this is a lower bound on quantum communication complex. And so far, it's been quite a good lower bound. This is basically the proxy we've used uh, for quantum complexity. Now, there's this recent paper that shows that actually uh, they're not quite the same. This might be, an, for some functions, might be an exponential gap between the log approximate rank and the quantum communication complex. Or actually, what they prove is a lower bound on you know, separating this guy from randomized classical <coughs> communication complexity. But they conjecture the gap should also exist for, qu for quantum. OK. So yeah, let me go to the next uh, combinatorial lifting theorem. It's actually the one we'll hope to prove in the, the second half. So this is by, uh, by me, Shahar, Raghu, uh, Thomas Watson, and David Zuckerman. So it is So it looks at non-deterministic communication complexity. Okay, so we can prove this for a different gadget, but first, so what is non-deterministic communication? Well, you can define it algorithmically by saying that the two players can make guesses, non-deterministic guesses. And uh, at the end of the computation, they just check. Like, or we accept an input if there's some choice of non-deterministic guesses that cause us to accept. So you know, somehow it's natural algorithmically. But there's a really simple combinatorial equivalent definition, which is that this equals the log of the cover number of the underlying Boolean matrix. The rectangle cover number, I should say. OK, so what is this? So yeah, I have my Boolean matrix. And I just want to express the set of ones as a union of rectangles. So here are some combinatorial rectangles. And maybe I just now covered all the one entries. So everything outside these three is a zero. So the non-deterministic complexity, again, is a log of how many rectangles I need to represent the, the one entries. I guess I should say, you know, why, why does such a combinatorial notion give you a protocol? Well, the two players, if they're given an input, boink, they can non-deterministically guess the name of a rectangle that um, that they should be contained in. So that's a, a log of how many rectangles you have, many bits to name a rectangle. And then it just takes one bit per player to check that, yes, my input is amongst these columns, Bob, rows, and columns. So it's, it's constantly many bits to check whether you're in the rectangle. A very simple example of this is when the two, in two players get a sequence of length n, and they are supposed to tell whether these two sequences are different. Yeah, so yeah, that's by the way, 
an example that shows that P is different than NP in communication complexity. So that's settled. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just a complement of the identity matrix. You have zeros on the diagonal, ones elsewhere. So this have, has a small cover number, but there's no way to um, partition it. Also, you can see its real rank is high, which, as we said, lower bounds deterministic communication complexity. This is like basically communication 101, uh, these kinds of observations. OK, so we now have a handle on this, this, this cover number in terms of the uh, decision tree analog. Again, you could try to define such a thing naturally by saying a decision tree is allowed to make non-deterministic guesses. And you know, given that we make the right guesses, how many bits do I uh, need to read of the input? But again, there's maybe a more direct combina <laughs> combinatorial uh, equivalent definition, which is that this is simply its DNF width. So you write f as an OR of ANDs, and you're trying to minimize the bottom fanning, so how many variables are feeding into an AND gate at the bottom. So so this I would say, and that's why I chose to show its proof, maybe the simplest combinatorial lifting theorem we know of. And also mention, it's nice as it is. I mean, once you've done these things for a bit, you, there's always this debate whether the applications are more important <laughs> or whether this tool is. And you know, I, yeah, I've been doing it a while that I you know, al already care about just the tools themselves. But, but here's to sell it uh, an application. So this is. So this is to something called the click first independent set problem. So use this lifting theorem to show for the first time non-deterministic or to be precise co-non-deterministic lower bounds for this uh, problem that Jan Kark is introduced in the 80s. So it's called click versus independent set. So it's some communication game that's defined relative to an end node graph. So you fix your favorite end node graph. And this problem, communication problem, is as follows. So maybe my favorite graph is, looks something like this. And this is a fixed graph. So both Alice and Bob know this graph. And for Alice, I give a click in the graph. So the input is a set of nodes that span a click. So maybe this is the input to Alice. And Bob receives an independent set in the graph. Your color. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but why do we have an eraser here? <laughs> okay, so this is an independent set in the graph. So that's... Oh, Good, good catch. Okay, let me. Okay, wh why do I want a third vertex? I don't know. So, there we go. So that's Bob's input. And the question is just for Alice and Bob to determine whether the two sets intersect. So it's really, again, set disjointness. Somehow you're looking for two sets, whether they intersect, except you play it on a graph. So you, there's a lot more structure to it. For example, any click and any independent set can intersect in at most one node. That's already some structure that you might um, exploit. So, okay. so we for the first time, super logarithmic lower bounds on the non-deterministic complexity. I should say, so here, non-determinism, of course, asymmetric. So if you have a function, maybe one side has an efficient non-deterministic product over the negation of a function may not have. And this is exactly the case here. So there's an efficient non-deterministic protocol where you just guess the name of a node that is in the intersection. So if you need to certify intersection, 
Well, you can do it with log n bits. But what, if, what about the complementary problem? I want to certify that the click and the independent set are disjoint. It's not obvious how to do that efficiently. And in fact, that's, that's what we show. So some super logarithmic lower bound. Um, so it's known that the complexity, even for deterministic protocols, is between log n and log squared n. But uh, this is the first kind of non-trivial lower bound. And OK, you might also ask, it seems like a weird toy problem. But it was actually introduced in a more serious setting at the time to prove lower bounds for linear programming formulations. And what's amazing about this is that it has so many different equivalent formulations. So one immediate consequence of this through non-trivial reductions is that this gives a construction of graphs that have high chromatic number but low biclic uh, partition number. So it's the, the graphs that are composed of edge disjoint unions of biclics, so each biclic is too colorable. So you think if you can construct a graph by putting in two colorable graphs, no, the, its chromatic number shouldn't be terribly large. But this gives con counterexamples to this intuition. So it's known as the allen sachs Simo conjecture. Um, the chromatic number can be quasi-polynomially larger than the biclic partition number. I really cherish these kinds of connections. I mean, you don't get such things for every problem in communication complexity, but this is a special, special case. And again, I should say, um, <laughs> how do you approach this? You apply lifting, but what do you actually prove in the query world? So the kind of separation we lift is we give an example of a little f. whose code on non deterministic complexities are this is, I guess it's the CNF width. It's polynomially larger than the uh, so-called unambiguous DNF complexity. So, okay, so NP here meant DNF width, but this measure I now name is unambiguous version of it. It's a DNF with the property that on a yes input, at most one of the AND gates can evaluate to true. So it's kind of saying that on any yes input, there's a unique or unambiguous witness. It's the relation between cover and partition. Yeah, and you're basically covering or uh, partitioning the, the yes inputs. And somehow to kind of map it to what's happening here, we had the property that you know, if the two sets intersected, they intersected in a unique position. So you had a unique witness there. So it only makes sense that, at least you know, in this very high level, that you know, somehow similar kinds of measures arise in the, the query world. OK. So that's something. OK, so so far we've had deterministic lifting some linear algebraic measures, non-determinism. And I guess a, a very natural uh, model that's so far omitted is just randomized, classical randomized communication protocols. And you know, given that this had been going on for a little while, it had developed into some kind of an obvious open problem. And so yeah, we managed to prove that last year. Okay, so my notation for bounded error randomized communication complexity. So that just means you have a randomized protocol. You can think of it as a probability distribution over deterministic protocols. So that on any input, if you pick a protocol at random, then the protocol computes the input correctly with high probability, let's say two thirds. So it's again using the index because now I realize I didn't quite specify. Maybe I'll do it the next hour. Um, this, this better gadget we get here. It's inner product mod 2 on um, logarithmically many bits. But here we're back to this uh, index gadget, which is slightly larger. And this is what you would expect. Uh, 
And um, so one interesting uh, story, I guess, related to this one was that at the time, there wasn't really much motivation to prove this for the sake of any application. Like there was, uh, we've developed so good tools to prove randomized lower bounds. So if you can come up with a question for which you wanted the randomized lower bound, you could just use like information complexity or you know, whatever tools we had to just directly do an ad hoc lower bound. So <laughs> when we proved this, we didn't really have applications. I guess we still don't have any new applications. We just have simplified proofs of existing results. So I guess I just mentioned in words. So one natural question is to try to separate uh, you know, classical randomized from quantum uh, communication complexity. And you know, similar questions people have asked in the query complexity setting. And there's in the recent years uh, uh, a new uh, record, which is uh, better than this quadratic gap witnessed by set disjointness. There's a, it's a, it's a power 2.5 gap. And it exists for query complexity. And you can use this kind of a lifting to just immediately get the same kind of a super quadratic gap for, for communication complexity. But again, I should mention, so before this work, there was an ad hoc proof of this, but it was horrible, horribly complicated. Um, yeah. Not, not <laughs> I don't know. If you query the bits in superposition. <laughs> okay, so let me mention uh, uh, one application that's you know all, almost uh, almost new. So this is in uh, kind of algorithmic game theory. It's by uh, Babichenko and Rubinstein. So they showed a, a lower bound for, uh, for the communication complexity of finding even approximate Nash equilibria. So the lower bound is something like n to a small power for So let me just say out carefully you know, what this communication problem is. It may not be obvious why economists would like communication low bound for such equilibria, but there are good reasons. Yeah, so, so here the players are given their payoff matrices as input. So it's some n by n matrix. Um, and OK, maybe it's constant precision. So both have their payoff matrices. Inputs are rational numbers. So come again? The inputs are rational numbers. Yeah, f finite precision. Uh, so th the input size in bits is order n squared. And what you need to find is an, uh, it's called an, I shouldn't use the same. So this is a small constant. So the mixed strategies, meaning this is what they're looking for is a probability distribution over their own actions, over the rows of the matrix for one of the players, over the columns for the other. Uh, that's an approximate Nash equilibrium, which means that, um, so a perfect Nash equilibrium, I hope you know, is, is uh, this kind of product distribution where uh, the first player, Alice, doesn't have any incentive to switch her strategy, given that Bob sticks with, the, with his own. So it can't uh, increase her expected utility. Uh, epsilon approximate just means that there's no switch that causes the utility to increase by more than epsilon. And somehow it's really key that you study approximate equilibria here, because it's known that such solutions, such uh, approximate equilibria always have a concise description. 
So you can show that, um, well, so you first talk about the exact case where you just need a, uh, an exact equilibrium. So there, even describing the distribution that's an equilibrium might take many bits. But once you relax it to say approximate is enough, now there's a polylogarithmic de description. So the two players are tr trying to find something that has a small description, yet they need polynomially many bits to, to find it. So I, I guess the algorithmic game theory people really cared about this. I think the result was uh, featured in the Quantum magazine at the time. And it's a natural continuation of what they've been trying to do in the computational setting, where they can show finding um, Nash equilibria as complete for PPAD or some hardness uh, results. I guess I should also. Come again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have to find one. There's yeah. There is a difference from this. I mean, of course, in Poland functions, there is also one bit out, and it can be hard. This problem always has a solution. Like you, you know that there is a Nash equilibrium, even exact. And you can find anyone you like, even approximate, and it's hard. The side effect that there's always one. Yeah, it's, it's hay in a haystack, but you're <laughs> guaranteed the thing is in there. Um, which is a completely different setting. I mean, complexity theorists talk about TFNP problems, or so total NP search problems. So yeah, let me also mention that we have um, just now as Fox improved this to a near optimal lower bound. And I, the point I want to make about this is that because these guys were using this lifting theorem, which is lossy <laughs> because of the size of the gadget. You'd think a log n factor here and there doesn't matter. But it turns out in proving something like this, you want to reduce problem loss of this form inside here. Oftentimes, the size of the gadget kind of blows up exponentially. So something that's log n is going to blow up into a polynomial, and you lose polynomial factors in the lower bound you, you want to get. So to get something that's really close to tight, um, we really needed quantum size gadgets, and we don't have them. So let me maybe just write it down as a, an open problem, because that's, at least for me, the most important. So I want constant size gadgets for any of these combinatorial lifting theorems. So here's an example of what we can do so far. It's not a fully general lifting theorem, but it's, you know, you can say something about these guys. So <laughs> in short, what can you do? Well, here's an example of a function for which we know tight lower bounds, linear in n, even for randomized protocols. And it has a quantum size gadget. So the natural proof strategy is to reduce from this function. So this is kind it's really easy. That you can prove randomized lower bounds for these composed functions, where g is now constant size, by embedding an instance of set disjointness. And so one way to embed it is to kind of observe what's happening here. Is that or is a maximally sensitive function. The or one's input is such that if I flip any one of the n bits, the function changes value. So the or one's input is sensitive. And you can define <coughs> a notion of sensitivity for any Boolean function. So you can maximize over all inputs, try to find an input such that for many places, if you flip the, the bit, the function changes value. And if you have such a sensitive function, it's not hard to embed set disjointness uh, inside this composed function. And then you can just compute, <laughs> conclude a lower bound like this, because you know, we know set disjointness is hard for randomized protocols. And you can even be more, more fancy and say there's something called block sensitivity, which is you know, larger than sensitivity. Um, and such reductions still work. And we've gone even further. There's a notion for search problems called critical block sensitivity. And that's actually what goes into this, uh, this optimal lower bound. So it's, at the end of the day, merely a reduction from set disjointness. 
But yeah, that's basically what we can do, is just set this jointness. OK, um, maybe as a very last thing before the break, just want to maybe advertise what I was planning to talk about next week, which kind of breaks away a little bit from this pattern of looking at you know, these uh, different flavors of communication complexity. So this is maybe next week. Can you just say, so what's the open problem for static gadgets? Like what, is there a conjecture? OK, let me do that instead of this. Like you'll be here next week anyway, so why am I? OK, so um, I, I can give you a kind of a concrete um, conjecture of what should be true, at least. It's like a, almost like a minimal requirement for any kind of combinatorial lifting theorem to hold. So yeah, you would like to find a constant size gadget. In fact, constant size index gadgets are basically complete. They embed any constant size um, Boolean matrix. Just make M constant. Right, so make an M constant here and prove the following. That if you have, you know, for any rectangle in the input domain of this, uh, um, of the N gadgets, so so if this, um, okay, so maybe for concreteness, this might be V bits per gadget per party. And there are n of them. So if this has density, large density, so it contains something like 2 to the minus c fraction of all inputs. So in a communication protocol that communicates c bits, these are typically the sizes of rectangles you expect to get out of the protocol. So you need to basically understand rectangles of uh, this size. So the conjecture then is that um, you need to find some kind of a query structure in this. Maybe this will become becomes clearer in the next half. The conjecture is that the image of the rectangle you know, through the gadgets. So if you feed all these pairs of inputs to the n gadgets, okay, you get some set of uh, n bit strings as output. And the conjecture is that the image contains a subcube of low code dimension. So that subcube is just a set of, so maybe I'll, I'll draw it like this. Um, just yeah. So there's some way to fix a few bits. Okay, roughly C of them. And the all the remaining bits are unrestricted. Such so that any string of matching this pattern appears in the image. Okay, so this is a good teaser for the next hour. You know, we'll prove exactly this kind of a statement, but not for a constant size gadget, but for a log n size gadget. And that's. It almost does. So this is the crucial step. Like, uh, I'm going to prove this, which says <laughs> one way to kind of think of it is I'm given a bunch of rectangles, and many of them are large, turns out. And from them, I want to extract, um, well, subcubes, so sets accepted by the AND gates at the, in this DNF representation. So proving something like this is very close to proving a lift. You have to do a bit of more work, and I, I guess we'll see yeah. see that. Yep. 
That was the whole story to begin with. Yes, the decision yes. trees are about 16 feet. These are cubes, and uh, these are the numbers. Yes. I wonder if you're a systematic, I mean, we see you on the platform many, you have a really simple complexity to a more complicated one. Is there a systematic way to identify? So, I don't know, it makes some sense that even the, the middle, uh, the original trunk, mm. the trunk well, the most systematic I can come up with is you can define both communication and query analogs of these Turing machine classes. That's what I've kind of been suggesting with my notation. Um, but there are more subtle settings where it's not so clear. You have to think a bit, like let's say the rank and degree. There are many here for me. Yes, otherwise. Yeah. Also, maybe I should mention a, a major open problem is to prove a quantum. Um, lifting theorem. So that's like PQP. It's an obvious problem, but I don't know. I'm not a quantum person, and even the quantum persons are kind of stuck. So. But there are connections like this for full complexity and for other uh, very different or various uh, monotone circuit classes. Yeah, it's basically you can try to apply such tools for any application area of communication complexity. And there are this many application areas. So. So we uh, so we have a break. Yeah. Okay. So the only goal in the second part is to prove this lifting theorem for n p. So that's these two notions again. And the gadget I'm going to use is it's called the inner product gadget uh, for b bits. So it takes b bits from Alice, b bits from Bob, outputs one bit, which is just the inner product mod 2. So the choice of the gadget, it doesn't, it's not super um, important. You could choose even like a random gadget and it would work for this argument. It just has to be you know, somewhat hard. And this is one of the canonical examples we know of that are you know, really hard, actually. <coughs> so. I w yeah, so. A lot of enough because it would contain other. Yeah. So if, when I say random, I just mean also that as a, the random function will have the property that we need at some point. Um, so I'm not even, w wouldn't be even using the randomness per se. But it's an obvious case that there's a specific property which will hold for just any function. And that's uh, sorry, which paper? Right. Um, yeah, certainly if you want the smaller and smaller gadget, you, know, you would use different properties. But this proof would, would work for anything. So OK, let me reformulate the goal here. Um, yeah, but as a philosophical note, there's always two ways of thinking about proving these sorts of things. Um, and I think the knee-jerk reaction for many researchers is that you know, we want to take a lower bound in the simpler model and strengthen it into a lower bound in the stronger model. But I want direct proofs, more direct ones. I want to view them as simulation theorems of saying you have this uh, algorithm in the strong model, and I can simulate it in the weaker model. So I, I formulate this in, in this more direct fashion, that I'm given this rectangle covering of the one entries. Mm. They cannot do anything clever. Yeah. That's a simulation job. Yeah, maybe the point was more about so whenever you have a model you can you can minimize its complexity in many ways. I mean the existence of an algorithm, but how do you kind of witness the non existence of an algorithm? So for uh, for decision trees, for example, it's an adversary argument that uh, a strategy to answer queries in a way that doesn't fix the value of the function. And you know, especially this linear algebraic lifting theorems uh, are historically proven in this more kind of this weird way when you start by witnessing a lower bound, 
like it's some bilinear programming duality. I don't want to go into it. Uh, but here we kind of flip it. We, we start with an algorithm and end up with an algorithm. So <laughs> this is the algorithm we have. We are given this covering of the one entry. So i goes from 1 to Let's say I have 2 to the d of these. So the NP complexity is d. And these just cover all the one entries. OK. And the goal is to give this DNF decomposition for f. Or really, what suffices is to just show that for any one input of this outer function, z, that it has a, a low certificate complexity. So there are only a couple of entries I can read and kind of certify that z is a one input. I'll write this down more carefully. So for any one input, I want to find a width, OK, roughly d, a certificate. Okay, let me define this, what, what, what is a certificate. If you're really careful, you can even find a certificate with d over log n. That would be introducing this additional log n factor to the theorem. But we, we don't care about log factors for now. Simplicity, just d. Right, so uh, my z is here. So it's some binary string. And a certificate for it is, well, it's a partial assignment that's consistent with z. And it fixes at most d bits. And to say it's a certificate is to say that any input that matches this pattern is a one input of the function. So this is kind of a low, you can think of the testing this condition, it's an AND gate of low fan-in. So if I can find such a certificate for every z, my DNF is just an OR of all the certificates I found. I mean, yeah, I had in mind a picture. Um, I don't know what you had in mind, but uh, so <laughs> yes. So, so, so this is the communication matrix of this composed function, and I've now fixed this z, which is an input to the outer function, which is an output of the gadgets. So, I think of the matrix as being partitioned into different fibers. So I'm now interested in a particular z, so its fiber. So by the way, my large g is just n copies of the gadget. So this was a one input of the outer function. And so this is the set of all strings x and y that whose image through the gadgets is z. The whole communication matrix is partitioned into two to the n different fibers. And roughly what we're going to prove is that I want to find a certificate for this. So even before, just to make sure what this picture is, every, <coughs> every input to x and y to Alice and Bob, which fall in this matrix, when you evaluate, so uh, That's the number of rows and columns. Yeah, it's just the input domain of the gadget. These are the rows, these are the columns. Yes. Yeah. So if you pick x and y from here and you compute the gadget, it's z. So it's the set of all such x and y. So first you have a non-boolean matrix, which is just applying the gadget on the 
Yeah, if you want, on the xy, and then on the non-Boolean matrix, you apply the predicate, which gives you the Boolean matrix. Yes. So let me write down again what is a certificate um, uh, we're looking for. So I want to satisfy three conditions. So the strategy will be to find, uh, firstly, we'll actually do it, we'll find one of the rectangles in the covering. And well, you can't say much about the rectangles given to us, they're just arbitrary. So we'll clean it up a little bit and find a more structured one, the sub-rectangle, R prime, which gives us the certificate in the following sense. So so the image of uh, this R prime is exactly kind of the sub-cube uh, of the certificate. So it is co-dimension D subcube. So back to this. It's, it's a set of strings that match a particular pattern. That's what I've said so far. Uh, a second property is it needs to be specific to Z. So we're looking for a certificate for Z. So in terms of sets of strings, I just want that Z is in my subcube. And finally, it needs to be a certificate for the function. So only the subcube only contains yes inputs. Here is really the first property. How can I enforce structure on ra large rectangles? How can I um, intuitively show that if, if you communicate only a few bits, if you have a large rectangle, then well, what can you do? You can fix some of the gadget outputs, but most of them are completely unrestricted. So they span the whole subcube. And on the other hand, it's just not true at least because the, the bits you could have given were just the majority. So I, I should mention the third property is automatic, uh, as uh, you know, according to our strategy, because we will find R prime as a sub rectangle of one of the rectangles we've been given, and, and you know, these are all one inputs of F. So the, this is really kind of automatic. This this property. This is the crux. This is some subtlety. I don't know if I, okay, but we'll see if I have time to put the whole proof. You cannot do it for every RI, right? For every R in the cover. It, it just needs to be large. Yes. Okay. So that's what I'm going to use eventually. So uh, let's, uh, let's work towards the first property. And just assume that we're given large rectangles. So there's a, a, an absolute key definition, which we actually introduced in this work, and it's been used uh, a, a lot um, 
later on. Even when Shahar visited, he gave an analog of this for hypergraph, I think, in his talk. So uh, we'll define what it means for a random variable to kind of have a lot of entropy. So I'm going to think of the rows and columns in my given rectangle as kind of random variables. So there are sets, but you can think of them as random variables, like uniform over the set. So I'm going to give a su sufficient condition for a, one of these random variables to be you know, really nice, to have a lot of entropy. So I say that a random variable is dense if whenever I look at projections of this or marginalizations of this random variable to different uh, blocks of coordinates. So there are n blocks each of b bits. And no matter what subset of blocks I look at, Now, I require that the random variable has you know, lots of entropy. So how much could the projection onto A have entropy? The maximum possible is just the number of bits there, which is B per block times how many blocks I'm considering. But the definition stands is that I have at least uh, you know, almost all of this. So something like 0.9 of the maximum possible entropy. And another subtlety is, um, you know, people who have seen, seen extractors before, is that Shannon entropy itself is not quite sufficient in these sorts of arguments. So we'll look at something called mean entropy, which is, uh, maybe I'll just so define it here, just a more robust notion of entropy. It's just a byword for the size of a set, actually, as you'll see. So this is just defined as the minimum over all outcomes of the log of the reciprocal of the probability. So the intuition here is that if this was really just uniform over a set, the random variable is uniform over our set, we just say it's flat. Uniform over our set, then this definition just reduces to the log of the support of the random variable. And the mean entropy is a slightly more general condition. Um, it turns out that any random variable of a given mean entropy you can write as a convex combination of flat random variables of the same mean entropy. So it's just some technical way of um, kind of talking about you know, logs of sizes of sets but in a slightly more general context. So our random variable here, it all will, always will be fat, uh, flat, just uh, uniform on a set. But when I project it or look at these marginalizations, it may no longer be flat. So that's why we have to and I use notions like this. Yeah, the only form at a time. So the only thing you know from the beginning is that when you replace i by n by the whole thing, is that it's at least b n minus b. That's that's the loud entropy. Yes. And from this you want to I don't know, simplify it so that it's the top. So does this all mean this? language of probability we know that we are going to use the probability method to derive this argument? No. 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 <laughs> so why do you mean this? Can you just give us a little bit of Well, I mean, the so I, I can tell you the, so the dilemma associated with this is that if I have a, a pair of such dense variables, then we are in really good shape. This set will just be everything. Like if you're dense on each coordinate, you don't have any knowledge of the outputs of the gadget. It could be every, anything. So. Yeah. Okay, so this property will imply that I, that what we need. 
being there. The unit distribution over R i, if R i, if the unit distribution over R i satisfy this definition, then we would get one, two, and three. We would get one in a very strong sense, which I'll write it down. So if x and y are dense and independent, I, I guess. So then, yes, since I now regard them as random variables rather than sets, let me say that the support of, if I plug these random variables into the gadget, look at the image and its support, well, it's everything. So that's really saying that it's a subcube of code dimension zero. So I'll only sketch how this is proved. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's like a one page thing if you wrote it out, but, but uh, I'll just uh, do a sketch of the proof. Sorry? So let's just denote by capital Z the the output uh, random variable. So you plug these dense inputs and you get some output. And we want to show this as full support. Um, but there's actually, we can show an even stronger condition if, if you regard this as a so distribution. So you can, just my notation as a function, define this as the This probability. So we'll show that, that not only do you reach every image element, but rather you're, as a random variable, close to uniform on all of it, not just even statistically, but even pointwise. So we'll show if it was perfectly uniform, it would be 2 to the minus n, but we can basically achieve that up to some multiplicative error. I mean, we don't need such a strong condition, but many subsequent lifting theorems need, like in the randomized case, you need this finer control on the operation of the gadgets. So are you saying that that's how you prove a randomized lifting theorem or what? So yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't quite do it block by block. So I do it by showing a condition on the, the Fourier spectrum of this, um, this output random variable. I'm not going to show you any calculations, don't run away. So it suffices to show a condition on the, the Fourier coefficients. So for any subset of output bits i, You can define the, the Fourier coefficient just. Now, what is the correlation of the parity of the bits on I? Um, so, okay, let me write it down. So it just measures how many times the parity is even versus odd on this subset of bits. So the Fourier coefficient is the indicator for vector for the subset of bits. Compute the inner product. Okay, so this is plus or minus one depending on the parity of the outcomes on such a subset. And a sufficient condition for this would hold is that these um, Fourier coefficient decay exponentially fast. So something like n to the minus 10 times the size of i. Um, so it's really, it's like a two-line calculation to show 
that if you have such a control on the Fourier tails, then you're actually this close to uniform. Um, like this number comes from basically just wanting this kind of a trivial union bound to hold that if you sum up all these Fourier coefficients, at least the non-empty ones, um, that this is sub-constant. Somehow you can look at it level by level. If it's a singleton, it's n, this polynomial is small, you can union bound over n different, and so similarly higher. So I, <laughs> I won't give the calculation from here to here. I'll just tell you how you bound these uh, coefficients. It's just saying that, again, specialized into singletons, it means that at least if you look at the output bits, they're roughly unbiased, each of them. But moreover, there aren't terribly many correlations between like pairs of output bits or really in any subset of output bits. So it's maybe intuitive that something like this would hold. Okay, so here's a quick sketch of how you do this. And yes, you, now you use the gadget. It's the only place in the proof you really care about the choice of the gadget. So, you know, I fix one of these non-empty subsets and I want to look at the um, So we have our n gadgets here, and now I'm interested in, for some subset of them, i, now what is the uh, bias of the parity of these outputs? So that's just, I'm computing the parity of all these gadgets, and I'm interested in, you know, how is the output biased or not? So this is a typical two-source extractor case. Like our inputs to these gadgets are x, you know, marginalized there and y marginalized there. It's a pair of independent sources of high mean entropy. It's exactly what people study in two source extractors. And this is a two source extractor. Um, so our choice for G itself was, well, it was this uh, inner product mod two. So that's itself a parity of um, ands of bits. So these are just bits now. So, so this whole thing, what we're interested in, if you just work it out, it's a parity of parities of ands. So this itself is just a larger inner product function. And OK, it's a super classical result by Chor and Goldreich, 88. Uh, I, I guess they defined two source extractors. So they showed inner product as a two source extractor in the sense that the output bias is, so it's exponentially small in the mean entropy that kind of exceeds mm -hmm. the threshold for this being a, a two source extractor. The threshold is 0.5 mean entropy rate. If you have two sources of more than 0.5 mean entropy rate, um, uh, they show the output is unbiased. And in fact, the bias goes down exponentially fast. So it's exponentially small in, okay, so our density assumption says you had 0.9 entropy rate, but you get something like 0.4, because that's the amount that is ex you know, exceeds the halfway mark, which is the threshold, times the block size times size of i. Uh, so this is the only place where we need to use a gadget size, which is large logarithmic. So B was chosen maybe as a hundred log n or something like that. 
Yeah. Just to get, you know, this kind of silly union bound calculation to work. And okay. Let me this result on the bias if you don't know or never seen two source extractors. It's just the orthogonality of the Hadamard. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Oh, like right. a sketch of you no, know, how does this work? Like how would you uh, calculate something like this? Well, you just draw the um, communication matrix for this inner product function. And okay, instead of zero ones as we'd be using, let's say the entries are plus or minus ones. So then it's just the Hadamard matrix. You have a Hadamard matrix here. And now you're interested in, you know, given two high mean entropy sources, X and Y. Again, you can draw it like a rectangle. It's a convex combination of rectangles, but let's prove it for one large rectangle. So what you're interested in computing then is just um, you know, how balanced is it? You know, how many pluses versus minus ones are there? And how would you co compute such a thing linear algebraic? Like how, do, how can I compute the sum of the entries inside here? Well, it's just, um, this is the matrix M, Hadamard matrix. And you just want to compute this by linear form. So you want a good bound on this. And that you get just from knowing that M has small spectral norm. Again, I'm not going to do the calculation. <laughs> it's an exercise now. Like, do the right uh, normalization and everything, and you get that kind of a thing out. OK, so that concludes the, the proof of the full image lemma. But somehow, this was too good to be true. We, we're just eventually given large rectangles. They need not be dense in every coordinate like this. So we need this kind of a pre-processing step where we can turn any large enough rectangle into a structured one. So that's the cleanup step I'm going to describe, where this guy will be fixed on some few subset of blocks for some gadgets. I'm going to be completely fixed. And then in the remaining parts, I'm going to be dense. So that gives us the sub, uh, subcube structure. I fix some of the gadgets, the inputs completely. Their outputs are fixed. In the remaining part, I'm dense. So I can apply this lemma on those coordinates. It's basically the, what, what follows. Separately for x and y. Yes, yeah, so that's, um, that's a subtlety. Let me just do it for one source first. So let's start with a so large rectangle. I'm given a large rectangle. Okay, of density two to the minus d. So, for, so far, I'm just assuming this. We'll see how a protocol gives us this. But OK, it's kind of intuitive why it should. But anyway, so if I just look at x, I want to pre-process it now, because it may not be dense. So what I do know about it, though, is that it has entropy or mean entropy. Well, the maximum possible could be n times block length. but um, I've lost d bits of entropy in some sense uh, from the full possible ones. So like one basic fact about mean entropy is that if I condition on an event, then the mean entropy can't go down too much. So can only go down by the log of the reciprocal of the probability of the event. Just follows from definitions again. So I claim that we have a, such a bound on the mean entropy. 
That's just because if I had a uniform distribution here, I would have n times b, exactly. But since this is a smaller one by an event whose probability is this, I do lose only d bits here. OK, but it, again, it may not be dense, because what if all this, this loss of entropy happens in a few coordinates? You could be completely um, fixed there. So my, the way I'm going to pre-process it is I'm going to find the box that fails the density condition. I'm going to fix my variable on those coordinates and hope that the remaining will be dense. Yeah. Okay, such that the the density condition fails. So Yeah, so this is just log n, and interesting protocols have like maybe some polynomial communication. So let's say it's root n, it's a good number. So okay, here the uh, mean entropy rate is smaller than 0.9 of. So it's a maximal such set, and I'm going to fix x on that. So I'll define x prime as x conditioned on on these blocks. I fix the random variable to one of the very likely values. So a here will be a witness to this. So to say that mean entropy is small is to say there's one outcome that's too likely. So the probability of this outcome alpha is too likely. Okay. So I've just written here <laughs> this condition, but it's witnessed by this, this outcome. So that's how I uh, condition my random variable. So now I claim I'm in good shape in the sense that I didn't fix too many coordinates. I only fixed at most roughly d of them. Um, and you can see that from just, so one way to see it is to say, in this inequality. So what is the, we call this the deficiency. So the number of bits you lack from having full entropy. So what's the deficiency here? The full entropy would be b times that, but we don't quite have that. The, we lack 0.1 b from the full entropy. So this is the deficiency here. But our overall deficiency is d. And you know, if I projected my ran random variable, it's again a property of uh, I mean entropy that if I project, the deficiency can't increase. So even when I look at the projections here, this guy here, the deficiency, needs to be smaller than d. Okay, now you just solve for <laughs> the size of i. Actually, you can get that uh, the number of blocks we fixed was d over b, but we didn't define uh, care about log factors for now, so this is suffices. And what remains out of the random variable, so if I look at the blocks that I didn't fix, so this is dense. And to see that it's basically by the maximal choice of these uh, subsets. If this wasn't dense, it means you know, there's some subset with too low uh, mean entropy. But then you could have, in this step, already chosen a larger set. 
Again, it's like a one-line calculation. Okay, let me maybe draw this as a... I'm not saying there's a unique maximum high, right? Just pick one maximum. Any, any. True. Okay, maybe I'll... So let me just draw a picture of what happened. I have this conditioned variable, and it looks like this. So here's the entropy, the coordinate, this is zero entropy, b bits of entropy, and I have some subset that I fixed. So <laughs> the entropy is zero, but in the remaining, it, well, I'm dense. So it's not like a perfect picture, I guess you could Say I've now drawn uh, the amount of entropy per singleton blocks, but density really says you know, for any subset of these blocks, you have something. So to get this property one, I would really like to do the same pre-processing for this other guy. So I would like y to look exactly the same after some pre-processing. Okay. So you're fixed on the so exact same blocks and then you have your dense elsewhere. Like if I had a pair of such random variables, so that would define this, this guy, well then the image would be a subcube of co-dimension exactly. So this is the number of blocks that are fixed and I can uh, apply the full image lemma here. Okay. <laughs> so this is So that would be the desired conclusion, if only I could pre-process this with exactly the same set of blocks that I fixed. But uh, yeah, like <laughs> Avi was already saying earlier, that's have to work a little bit to achieve that. Like why would the two random variables be in any way synced up so that I could get this? So there's this minor adjustment to this argument. So instead of just pre-processing a single variable, you do both at the same time, you just consider them jointly. So now maybe I get a factor two here, because I have, um, and that's my full entropy in the whole matrix, and I lose this much. Um, I think just D, like, because this is, oh, yeah. I know I kind of, restrict or condition these two variables simultaneously. So I'm looking at now block where both guys fail the density condition. Again, maybe there are factors of two here. And I rest restrict them both. This by some outcome, y by some other outcome. And basically, nothing changes. Um, there is only a slight, the only subtlety, I should say, is that the, like these, these claims still hold, you can get. So you have this condition that, well, okay, I shouldn't say, is quite yet. The argument only gives you that <laughs> these guys are jointly dense somehow if you okay so that means for any subset of blocks J in this complement of I
we get 0.9 of 2b But again, this is minor adjustment. I really want this manner to be held for both of the modules separately. But okay, if I <laughs> further marginalize this random variable, I drop this. It's a basic fact that the mean entropy can only drop as, ma as many bits as I dropped, which is this much. So I still get, well, 0.8. Um, but you know, it's just a constant equally well as this point 0.9. So it's just, it's just more subtlety. Is there a total product? Is it not enough? It's enough. That's this point. It's enough. Anything bigger than half is good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is also this point that maybe you don't need both the sources to have 0.5, only the sum in average. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so this <laughs> basically proves the first one. I mean, given a large rectangle, I can always find this structure. So by the way, going back, this what, uh, was I, what was I conjectured to hold even for a constant size gadget, but we don't know how to prove it. So this automatically holds. So it's only this uh, minor detail. Okay, 10 minutes, good. Um, so I'll sketch how you actually ensure this too. So, so it's a subtle point. So why? No, how can our argument now possibly miss a yes input? So pictorially, what might have happened is I'm looking at this fiber here. So they're all yes inputs. So that set in particular is covered by the two to the D guys. So I can find one large one that covers you know, that fraction of the, the fiber. But now if I run this argument, do, do this restriction, well, what if after I restrict x and y, what I get is a rectangle like, okay, a rectangle like this. So now it misses this fiber. It doesn't, I mean, it's, a, it's image is a subcube, but it doesn't contain this z. So this is the final subtlety you, you need to address. And yeah, I'm just going to maybe, just going to do kind of proof by picture. So you run exactly the same argument in the restriction x and y, except now you don't make them independent. You, just, you, just, you don't take just the rectangle, rather, you take x and y randomly from this set, so intersection. I could use colors. So they're highly dependent. So in a similar kind of a calculation, I can conclude that these guys have um, small a small deficiency. The only thing that kind of changes is that, okay, so instead of mean entropy conditions like this, okay, maybe there's some additional minus one here because it, for a single gadget, I in a fixed it out output, which is kind of one bit of loss. It doesn't really affect any of these calculations. So I can still take this jointly distributed pair, make them dense by somehow further restricting them. And now, so now after restriction, the marginals are dense, and this is what remains. So clearly, <laughs> because these guys were conditioned to output z after restriction, I'm still outputting z. I'm still specific to z. And the final thing is, well, I, I define them to be 
now highly correlated but at the end I'm just going to blow them up into a product distribution because I want to apply the full image lemma which well it's kind of important that I apply it for a pair of independent variables so I define them dependent but I can just blow it up in a product distribution say you know take the marginals of the distribution and define this this larger distribution still lives in the, the rectangle and apply the full image lemma there. So this argument gives me this additional property too. Okay, so it was a bit sketchy, but uh, uh, there's not much going on. Um, so yeah, I think any, any questions of this? Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> that's the kind of what it looks like, but so it's whenever you margin us to some subset of blocks, the minus ones contribute, well, amortize like mi one minus one per block. So it's kind of you're running the argument you know, inside, not relative to the whole domain, but relative to this this uh, fiber. So the minus ones then amortize, they don't contribute anything to the entropy rate because this was log n or something. Um, yeah, so th it's a subtle thing, but you can use the fact that it's amortized. More questions? All right, thanks. Okay.